Okay, I think we can get started. I am very happy to introduce Dr. Brian Wood, who is an associate professor in the Division of Allergy and Infectious Disease in the Department of Medicine at the UW. Brian, welcome. Uh, my predecessor, Susan Buskin, started a tradition of asking facility or present presenters for a fun fact to share at the beginning of their talks. And so Brian's fun fact is that he's just returned for a year and a half semi-sabbatical. I guess that's not a full sabbatical in Lusaka. And I think we're going to hear a little bit more about that during the talk today. I'm going to turn it over to Brian in just a minute, but I want to let you all know in the audience that Brian will stop a couple of times throughout the talk to ask if there are any questions. Um, otherwise, you can probably put some things in the chat and I'll try and keep an eye on the chat and maybe we can address those when we get to those breaks. And with that, Brian, please take it away. Roxanne, thanks. Thanks for everyone who organizes this conference for inviting me. It's an honor. As Roxanne, Roxanne said, I was in Lusaka, Zambia the last year and a half, semi-sabbatical because I was still involved in a lot of UW work still helping lead our local regional project echo just from a very different time zone and then as i'll talk about got involved in a lot of project echo work there so it will relate to this talk i was asked to talk about project echo with a focus on the hiv experience i will talk a lot about our regional hiv project echo experience and i'm going to go a little bit beyond that as well and i altered the title of this a bit. I, I really think of Project ECHO as promoting equity in the sense of promoting equitable access to high quality care wherever a provider is practicing, wherever a patient presents. So I'm going to come back to that theme throughout the talk. And I, it's nice to see some familiar names and folks who have been involved in some of the research on Project ECHO. I'll, I'll get back to the research in a bit. To frame this, I want to tell you about a real case to someone from our regional program. This was years ago, but uh, uh, really happened. And I set this as framework to start thinking about um, our current healthcare system and, and gaps and ways to improve and ways this program <clears throat> could be useful. So a provider who's just out of residency is practicing in a rural location in the Pacific Northwest. A patient presents who is pregnant, has HIV, has been struggling with taking their pills, has a detectable viral load, also on routine testing, has latent TB and syphilis. The patient is also struggling with depression. They're unhoused, unemployed, have a history of substance use, and speak English as a second language. Now, what I want you to think through here is how does that patient access high quality care for all of these issues? How does that provider new to practice with incredible time pressures in a primary care practice in a rural setting with very limited access to specialists, especially mental health and addiction medicine specialists. How do they provide high quality care for all of these issues? And then how can we as an academic medical center help support high quality care uh, for situations like this? So I, I, I plant this because I think it, it serves as an example of what we're trying to do with Project ECHO. What I'm going to tell you about today is a little bit about the model, how it started and how it's grown. I'll talk a little bit about our experience and then the growth around the world. And then I'll circle back at the end to talk about the data and the research. The two questions I would love for you to ruminate on during this, how could this model help you meet your needs and goals, whatever your work is, and then as I will talk about the evaluation piece for Project ECHO, especially at the patient level, has been very challenging. How would you, if tasked with evaluating Project ECHO, how would you go about that? And we'll come back to a project at the end that we worked on that um, Susan, Richard, others on this call uh, were instrumental with uh, um, uh, making happen. And, and we'll talk a little bit about how we did that and then where the field goes from there. So with that, what is Project ECHO? It stands for Extension for Community Health Outcomes. The mission at Project ECHO, the goal is to touch or improve the lives of 1 billion people by 2025. That's not a typo. The goal is 1 billion. And we have some current efforts to measure how we are doing with progress towards that goal. Project ECHO started in 2003 at the University of New Mexico. Dr. Sanjeev Arora, who's a hepatologist, uh, initially conceived of it and started and started it. 
The challenge at that time in New Mexico was thousands of people diagnosed with hepatitis C and only two specialists at the academic medical center trained to treat hep C. And this was before the DAA era. This was the era of interferon and ribavirin and more complex treatment. The wait list to get into the specialist was months. So what Dr. Rohr and colleagues did, as you can see in the photo here, was they started to hold weekly sessions. This is now commonly known as a virtual community of practice or a VCOP, where they invited practitioners from the uh, uh, from the community, from community clinics, from correction sites to join, to present their cases, to get advice on treatment. What they found was that by doing this, patients could be treated locally. They didn't have to wait to see the academic specialist or travel to Albuquerque. Uh, and the wait times to see the specialist went down dramatically. They published in the New England Journal in 2011 that the outcomes, the SVR, hepatitis C cure outcomes were similar regardless of whether patients were treated in the community with the support of Project ECHO or at the academic medical center. This was their outcome data published in the New England Journal, again, before the DAA era. Um, but you can see uh, there were similar results whether folks were treated by their primary care practitioners in the community or at a correction site as opposed to at the academic medical center. The cost effectiveness, um, the program was found to be cost effective this data um, wasn't published, but later data on cost effectiveness found the same thing and was published. So this was 2011. This was New England Journal. This was the first time people went, whoa, Project ECHO can work. Um, this is a chronic complex condition that is not easy to treat and practitioners in the community can do it with the support of specialists without, uh, uh, without waiting to travel and to see the specialist for a consultation. The model really hinges on a couple of things that we find key. And honestly, it's not the technology. It's especially these days, it's not the gathering everyone across a broad region using tech. In the early days, that was huge and impressive. And we gave whole talks on how to get multiple docs and clinics on video together. Back in 2012, when I was first involved in Practico, that was huge. Now, of course, post pandemic, everyone's on Zoom, it's easy. So the, the, the technology has never been at the center of ECHO though. What's at the center of ECHO has always been relationship building and trust and connections and grassroots community building, connecting the academic specialists to the community of providers and a commitment that those specialists and providers are going to be on together every week for mutual support, ongoing, continuing learning, sharing of resources, and helping to uh, provide the highest quality of care to patients wherever they present. So what makes ECHO unique, again, especially nowadays, is not the technology, it's this commitment to a longitudinal virtual community of practice. So when providers join, we tell them that we expect them to participate regularly. It's not a one-off consult service. It's not a come once or twice a year when you have a patient to present. It's come every week, listen, learn, support your colleagues, participate in the discussion, learn from the cases that other colleagues are presenting, help share your experience and help problem solve as a community. So it's about regular participation and relationship building, peer-to-peer -peer support, collaborative problem solving, resource sharing, as I'll talk a bit more about, just-in-time training and learning, working together on QI projects, and really creating a non-hierarchical uh, learning environment and clinical support environment for everyone. We talk on ECHO about disciplinary humility. We've all heard about um, cultural sensitivity or cultural humility. We talk about disciplinary humi humility on Project ECHO, and we have folks who join who are brand new to HIV care or who uh, uh, don't have nearly as much training as, as the more experienced ID docs involved, and everyone is welcome. Uh, everyone's opinions and experience are valued and everyone over time after years of participating becomes an expert and we ask them to share their experience. We have actually spent time studying adult learning theory and really try to hone the model to meet adult learning theory. We engage learners in the curriculum development process. We encourage active participation and interactive discussions, try to connect learning to past experience, create a supportive learning environment, 
really center all of the learning on cases, cases that come from the practitioner's clinic, not from our clinic here at the academic center, but from their clinic. Um, and we try to keep any didactic type talk involved in the program short. We talk about low dose, high frequency. We know that people just you know space out after a long lecture. So we focus on, on these facets of proven adult learning theory to try to make the program as successful as possible. So it's not a one-time consultation service. It's not a webinar. Again, these are the things that I think make it unique. It obviously also is not telemedicine. We are not as the specialist seeing the patients directly. That absolutely has its role. I think we learned, especially during the pandemic, the importance of um, being able to connect to patients virtually, whether it's by video or phone. That's not what ECHO is doing. ECHO involves the practitioners, the providers, uh, the multidisciplinary team serving patients at the clinic, all connecting to each other to help support each other and share resources. Some programs have a uh, um, lived experience or, or patient representative, um, but we are not seeing the patients we talk about directly. We hope that it complements. We hope that it complements these other uh, uh, modalities like telemedicine, and similarly helps to improve the quality of care. We also see it as a bridge across uh, many different disciplines, and we connect individuals from many different fields to talk about all kinds of different chronic complex conditions, as I will discuss. There are programs now for all of these topics, which you see here listed, and many more. Now, how did Project ECHO come to the Pacific Northwest? So in 2009, University of Washington uh, was actually the first replication site outside of University of New Mexico or outside of New Mexico um, uh, uh, through a Robert Wood Johnson grant. John Scott and colleagues launched a hepatitis C program here. I, again, it was one of the first replications outside of UNM, and that was followed by programs for HIV, addiction, psychiatry, and chronic pain. You can see at the bottom a, a publication um, that describes the early development of the programs here and a couple of the images from that publication from the early days. And you can see there at the bottom the folks who were involved in the, the early replications. Our HIV Project ECHO program happens weekly. We start each week, again, with a very focused, short, didactic update. Here's an example of one from Lindley Barbie, who I know many of you know and worked with uh, before she went to CDC. And after that initial 15 to 20 minute talk, quick didactic update from a local or national expert, then we talk about practitioners own cases. So the practitioners bring to us cases from their clinic that they are struggling with. And I'll show you more about the questions we tend to be asked. At the table, here's a snapshot of a session, um, at the table, and now it's all by Zoom, so this is pre-pandemic, but at the table, we have experts uh, from HIV pharmacy, HIV social work, viral hepatitis, HIV and infectious diseases, somebody facilitating the session. Uh, not at this session, it looks like, but generally we also have an expert in psychiatry and addiction medicine. We have received feedback from practitioners who join that that real-time access, especially to HIV specialty, pharmacy, social work, mental health, which is so difficult to obtain in more isolated locations is really crucial and key to helping patients and to success of the program. Once a practitioner presents their case to us, we summarize all the discussion points, we send any links, resources, studies that were discussed. And so a practitioner presents their case and what they get back is, is a packet of material with discussion points, key clinical considerations, uh, um, points from each of the specialists, as well as any links, tools, resources. And what we hear from practitioners is that, is that they end up sharing these resources with colleagues in their clinical practice. 
We love also polling the group, the community. This is a way to ask practitioners from around the region what they are doing, especially in areas for which there's no clear guideline, for which there's no equipoise. This was a real question we asked back before the days of the recombinant zoster vaccine when there was a live virus vaccine that was very controversial whether to offer to people with HIV or not. And this was the true response. So this led to a fantastic discussion about pros and cons and what people are doing. So again, it's a way of sharing clinical challenges, sharing clinical best practices and connecting colleagues from around the region. And again, I come back to connecting them regularly. And what we found is that they develop relationships, they learn who's who, they learn who's doing what, and then they start reaching out to each other even between the sessions. So it's about building community over a very broad region. There's been an evolution in the programs at UW over time. Um, again, the, the hepatitis C program was the first. It is still ongoing. It's now evolved to cover both hep B and hep C and is a viral hepatitis program. It happens every Tuesday. Our HIV program happens every Thursday. There's a TB program that happens once per week, a, a really successful antimicrobial stewardship program. Uh, that continues to grow. Just recently, I saw there's a new program uh, under the initiative uh, Won't Go Back uh, that's helping primary care providers in the region maintain medication abortion access. There are uh, real newer programs in the last couple years that have been very successful for um, uh, uh, cardiometabolic conditions. There are successful ongoing programs for geriatrics and dementia. There's a really phenomenal program for autism and intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, there's a program on CBT for psychosis that I, I couldn't tell if it's still running or not um, since Eric Strickhan left, but, but um, was very active and successful and it may or may not still be going. There are new programs coming. Uh, the programs in development for, are for uh, gender affirming care, adolescent obesity, reproductive health, and there are others in the works. There have also been some time limited programs at UW. Um, you know, for example, when Suboxone uh, uh, first uh, um, um, it became a way to treat opioid use disorder. There was a program where practitioners could join a certain number of times, get certified, become confident prescribing Suboxone, um, um, and then move on. There are other programs like viral hepatitis, HIV, TB that have on, been ongoing for years. And as the fields evolve, the curriculum of, evolves, um, the participants, but some participants in our HIV program have now been involved since the beginning for over 10 years, and then we keep enrolling new participants as well. There are now Project ECHO hubs and programs in 81 countries in the world. The expansion has been really dramatic. This is a nice tool maintained by University of New, Me University of New Mexico where you can search for hubs and programs by country, by state, or by discipline. And I show this just as a, an example of how things have evolved. Um, I also want to give an example of national programs. So a lot of some programs are limited to one state, some a region, and then there have been some examples of national programs, including here across the United States. This was one program that uh, um, I was lucky to be involved with. This was a time limited 18 month program sponsored by HRSA. It was called End Disparities and it connected Ryan White clinics from around the country, from every region of the country. And providers and QI teams from Ryan White clinics were uh, involved in a regional group. So they had a monthly meeting with their regional group. And then what we called affinity groups or, or these were our echo groups and clinics uh, got involved and focused on improving viral load suppression for uh, one of these groups that uh, is known to suffer from the biggest gaps or disparities in viral load outcomes. So either MSM of color, youth, transgender individuals, or Black, African-American, and Latino women. So each clinic was involved in some in-person QI training, a monthly meeting with other clinics in their region, and then every two week Project ECHO session focused on one of these uh, groups. And then they tracked their data and tracked their gaps and their disparities in viral load rates between individuals of that particular group and their overall patient population. Um, overall 90 providers participated. We received a viral load data every two months for 18 months with an average of 110,000 data point, viral load data points uh, per two month cycle. 
and, and then found over time that the gap in viral load suppression between those uh, specific populations and individuals with HIV, not of those populations, did decrease. Now, certainly, there could have been other interventions at that time. We cannot say that our intervention was the only one that led to improvements in viral suppression and decrease in that gap. But I do think as a model for a national program, uh, it served really well to show that despite complications with time zones and distance and all sorts of things, a national program can be successful. There are other national programs in the US that have had a lot of success. There's an Indian country, ECHO, that covers a lot of primary care and other issues for tribal health clinics. Fenway Health out of Boston runs a gender affirming care ECHO that's really impressive and has had a lot of success. There have been a lot of adaptations for COVID and long COVID. Um, there's a program along the US-Mexico border to support TB care, and there are a number of others. The image here is an example of a program that came out of the early COVID pandemic, which was a collaboration between a lot of organizations to offer national learning and case discussion around COVID. Um, I'm going to turn next to some adaptations internationally before circling back to our uh, regional echo and the data and research piece. But first, maybe I'll pause there and see if there are any questions about the, the model and development and uh, history here in this country. And any questions, thoughts, or reflections at this point? I have a quick question, Brian. So you mentioned the HRSA funded reducing disparities echo. How are all of these other programs funded now? Yeah, the funding is a huge question. Thanks, Roxanne. So it varies is the answer. It varies from national funding. HRSA has uh, funded a number of programs to regional or state funding. For example, Washington State Department of Health has really seen the value of this and is now offering some funding to help with our HIV, TB, and viral hepatitis programs. Some states have actually now integrated funding for Project ECHO into their state budgets. It's actually a line item in their state budgets. New Mexico and Missouri being the, the states that have really succeeded in doing that. We've advocated for that at the state level here, and it's not yet happened, but it may in the future. We've had representatives from state Congress come and sit in on our programs, and we continue to push for that. And then there's a number of other um, organizations that have funded programs. There's some private funders and donors that have funded programs, so it really does vary. On an international scale, as I'll talk about, it's also all over the map. So HRSA has also funded a number of international programs. CDC is involved in other programs, WHO. Um, and then there also are some private foundation donors. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for extending for the question about funding. Other questions, thoughts? Okay. I'm going to jump forward then, but please feel free to uh, um, weigh in and I'll, I'll pause again for any other uh, uh, questions or reflections in a bit. I want to talk about the international development because I think that's been really significant. And then I'll circle back and, and um, return to our regional program and the research piece. So I was also lucky to be involved in helping develop the first program in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, in 2014, we started development for a program that launched in 2015 started with 10, uh, uh, pilot, 10 pilot spoke sites in Namibia. And this program launched in 2015 and has gone strong. We served as consultants. We went in and said, here's what we've done in the US. How can this help you meet your goals? How can we support you to get this off the ground? And then the team there has just taken it and run with it. So started with 10 sites, now over 50, now programs in a lot of different disciplines. Uh, the team, published some qualitative data on um, um, who's been involved. They've had a lot of involvement from nursing in addition to uh, other practitioners. Um, they've uh, reported on knowledge gain, professional satisfaction, continuing edu education credits earned, um, and reported that as of 2019, the, the Project ECHO was serving more than 140,000 people living with HIV across the country. The other super interesting thing the team in Namibia has done is adapted to COVID and reported on how they were able to adapt to COVID. 
including they had this really interesting report about how Project Echo and the connections that were made and the networks that had been created helped people along the Namibia Angola border who were struggling to get ART to continue to receive their ART despite the shutdown of the border uh, during the pandemic. So um, the program launched in Namibia, it's still going, it's successful, it's been a, a, a adapted, it's evolved, it's engaging more sites. And the other really interesting thing that Namibia and other countries have found is that once this network is created, when a new problem arises, COVID or other, there is this built-in real-time network to connect everyone, to talk about what's going on, to share resources, to get everything updated, and to spread the word about how to prepare, uh, prevent or to respond to things like outbreaks. This was a nice report from colleagues in Guatemala, Namibia, Kenya, and South Sudan, all of which have very robust programs about how they were able to adapt their HIV Project Echo platforms to respond to COVID. Programs have been developed for a number of different conditions around the world as well. I mean, within ID, there's HIV, TB, and MDR-TB programs. There are programs to strengthen labs, to do QI, to increase the capacity to do viral loads and other key laboratory measures for HIV, but also there are now programs in Global Health Security, there's programs for One Health, which I think is really fascinating, programs connecting doctors plus vet veterinarians plus farm workers and, and other people all involved in One Health, which I think just uh, has phenomenal uh, potential. There are programs in safe surgery, emergency response, a number of other chronic diseases. There also are also programs outside of medicine. There's some really robust, successful programs in education that connect teachers to help provide mutual support to teachers and help problem solve and do QI and increase the quality of education. So really it, it's a model for shared problem solving and increasing uh, uh, quality across broad regions, both within and outside of medicine. Some examples, MDR TB programs are running in a lot of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as in India. The, the challenge in, in some of the countries has been that so many people want to get involved. It's really hard to keep it interactive and engage everyone in the discussions. Some of the uh, uh, programs I was involved in, in, in Zambia had 200, 300, 400 people. And the challenge was not how do you recruit people to the to the program it was it was we have so many people how do we keep this interactive and there's a lot of different strategies and um, i can talk a little bit more about that but um, there's a bit of an if you build it they will come phenomenon where you where you you create this network and, and people are really eager to be involved and to um, to get the shared support, to get the ongoing learning, um, and and sometimes more show up than you anticipate. Again, there are really robust programs for laboratory scale up um, in, in in a number of countries um, across Africa. There there are programs in most countries in Sub-Saharan Africa now. Um, this slide is actually two or three years old, but at least two hundred launched partners, um, a number of prospective partners several super hubs which are hubs that uh, train local teams to do project echo um, i was lucky enough while in zambia to be involved with a couple of those um, and a lot of organizations currently building out to launch for the first time or expand project echo there also now are, are these really robust programs that uh, cover a number of countries um, I had the honor of going to Africa CDC in 2017 and, and sharing about ECHO and helping them plan to launch several regional centers. So that um, Africa CDC now has five regional centers, excuse me, four regional centers uh, that connect countries across regions of Sub-Saharan Africa to do surveillance for outbreaks and help respond to outbreaks. The Infection Control Africa Network also has a, a, a great multinational program, uh, as does the African Society of Laboratory Medicine. And then this program that I was I was uh, honored to, to help with a bit while I was in Zambia is called Southern Africa, uh, the Southern Africa Regional Echo Program, or SARI, they call it. Um, this was really developed as a response to COVID. So this program has engaged teams and participants from across Southern Africa initially for the first 
a year and a half or two years of the program just to, to tackle issues related to COVID, but now integrating education and discussion on best practices to responding to other outbreaks. Um, they've had sessions on, on MPOX, on cholera, on Ebola, on polio, on, on all kinds of different outbreak response. There's a similar, whoops, sorry. There's a similar program there's a similar program called the West Africa Regional Program, which actually has engaged people even outside of West Africa. Um, while I was in Zambia, I was lucky to uh, um, be tapped by CDC to help uh, develop a program that would connect all the graduates of their public health emergency management fellowship. Um, so uh, all the grads from this time limited CDC fellowship program were sort of going off and doing their own thing for uh, emergency outbreak response. And th in this way, we're able to stay regularly engaged, whether they were in uh, Africa or Asia or South America and share best practices, talk about challenges and talk about the best ways to develop emergency management response systems. Um, other examples internationally, again, there's lots. There are programs uh, being developed for uh, actually having launched for long COVID, for emergency medicine and emergency uh, response personnel training, for Ebola response training. Um, here's an example of Ebola response training in Uganda that involves some in-person training, some online modules, plus some Project ECHO learning. Again, there are more examples. There's programs planned for malaria and a number of other things. In Zambia, for example, I'll focus on this example uh, before returning to talking about our regional program and the research piece. So in Zambia, there are actually three different Project ECHO programs for HIV clinical care. There's a general HIV program that connects the civilian clinics and hospitals. There's a separate program that connects the military clinics and hospitals. There's a program for advanced HIV plus a program for viral hepatitis. Recently, um, the team there was able to train and help launch a national program for cancer prevention and detection, for laboratory scale up and accreditation, a, uh, another HIV program, I guess that's even for HIV programs, another program specifically for HIV QI, they decided to uh, again do a combination, a hybrid model of in-person QI training plus Project ECHO. And they decided to focus on the three areas of which they felt like they had the biggest need, adolescent viral suppression, serial conversions during breastfeeding, and adult retention in care. So clinics involved got in-person QI training, a QI coach. They have in-person meeting, eating, in -person meetings once a month. Then they have Project ECHO sessions to continue to uh, um, develop their own QI projects related to one of these three areas. Um, there are programs launched for long COVID. The Schmidt Initiative um, comes from Eric Schmidt, the, um, one of the, the leaders of Google whose uh, daughter suffered from long COVID and he, he decided to fund a number of programs around the world for long COVID. So this is a worldwide initiative to do Project ECHO for long COVID. Zambia has also trained teams and other programs in the work, <clears throat> works, excuse me, for polio and other vaccine preventable conditions, pulmonary medicine, midwifery, scaling up the electronic health record across the country, community health workers, and others. So I give you that example because that's the one I, I was involved in. I was able to help with some of the trainings. This was the first ever Project ECHO in-person training uh, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I was lucky enough to be a part of it. This is at the Institute of Digital Health, the first uh, institute of its kind, which is in Lusaka, Zambia. Um, but then I'm going to return to our regional experience and some of the data and research. Um, but let, let me stop there again. Questions, thoughts on the, the international growth? Okay. Well, I, I hope again, you're thinking about, okay, you know, how, how could this model be useful for other needs, but I wanted to give you that context for how, how the programs, how the model has grown, how it's expanded around the world, how it's being used for a lot of things. 
But now I want to return to our regional program and come back to data. And I'll be fully transparent that one way in which ECHO has been criticized is the lack of data, especially the lack of patient level outcomes data. So returning to the question I posed to you at the beginning, if you were involved in one of these programs or you were asked to evaluate one of these programs, how would you do that? So I'm gonna show you some of our qualitative data from our regional Project ECHO program here. Talk about a viral load analysis we did, which um, got a bit of uh, attention because it was the first ever a patient level outcome study of an HIV Project ECHO program. I, I think it remains, well, I won't say it's the only one, but it, it, it's the only one like it. And I'll talk a little bit more uh, about that. Some folks on this call, Susan Richard, were again, really integral to, uh, to getting that study uh, um, completed. And then I'd love to hear from you, your, your thoughts and reflections on studies and data and how to assess the success of a program like this. So our regional program uh, covers 10 states. It covers the same region as our AETC, our AIDS Education Training Center. Um, back in 2016, we published a descriptive analysis with some qualitative data. So we started with qualitative uh, research and publications, um, partly because that was the, the easiest to do. And I do think as a provider-centered intervention, getting the input from the providers involved is really key. And it helped us with our own QI and our, our improvement uh, of our own regional program. So starting with a survey of providers involved in our regional HIV Project ECHO program, you can see um, based on 45 providers who responded to the survey, you can see the breakdown here. It is not all physicians. We have had really, really um, engaged pharmacists, advanced practitioners, um, nurses, social workers, public health, uh, um, public health personnel, and others. You can see here the median experience in, uh, you can see here the median years treating HIV was five, the uh, median HIV uh, seropositive patient panel size was relatively small at 19, 38% reported practicing in a rural location. And then when we asked providers their, uh, to self-assess their improvements in confidence and knowledge taking care of people with HIV. There were improvements in a lot of uh, factors, a lot of measures of caring for people with HIV. Now this is self-assessment. There's certainly limitations to it. I actually think one of the most interesting things here is uh, respondents' confidence serving as a resource to other providers in their region which went up and we hear this from providers that they, 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 they learn on ECHO, they gain more confidence, they get these resources and then they share and they become a local expert, a local care champion and others in their region come to them. And I think that's one of the powers of the program. I also think these factors are really important. Again, these are providers often in isolated areas who are coming together and helping support each other. So reports of improvements in degree of professional isolation, especially in these areas where there is such high turnover of providers. You know, I, I think we shouldn't ignore. Providers report that they feel more, they feel more a part of a community of practice, they feel more connected to academic faculty, and their overall knowledge regarding HIV care also improves. The other thing we're able to do is track what questions were being asked, what cases providers are bringing up, and in that way, adapt the curriculum, uh, modify what we're talking about to help meet people's needs. And I thought this was interesting. We just tracked, you know, broad categories of questions we were being asked. And ART regimen changes comes up a ton. We published this in 2016, but that is still one of the most frequent questions we are asked. If a person has a suppressed viral load and you're, you're considering changing their regimen, that is a really uncomfortable thing. We are asked about that all the time. The other things we're asked about a lot acute symptoms, lab abnormalities, mental health, co-infection, that, that's gone down recently, but before the DAA, DAA era of hepatitis C treatment, that was very frequent, OI diagnosis and treatment. For a lot of these things, there are no clear guidelines and there's no one clear best practice. And I, I think that's interesting. And I think that's something that comes up a lot on ECHO. We aren't asked as often things like, like let's say PEP for which there's, you know, there's guidelines. Now, I dated guidelines, but there's guidelines, but things for which there aren't clear guidelines, there's no clear best practice, there's controversy, um, are things we are asked about a lot. 
Now, two other qualitative studies, and I'll turn to the viral load analysis. So one thing we noticed in the early years was we were often asked about treatment of HIV during pregnancy. Um, the sample case I showed you at the beginning, which I'll come back to at the end, was, was one of them, but certainly not the only one. We were often asked about uh, uh, treatment uh, of HIV, whether it was ART or related things during pregnancy. So um, uh, Tara Ness, who was a resident here and now is a PEDS ID specialist, um, helped lead this study where we asked practitioners uh, how much HIV Project ECHO helped them feel confident caring for pregnant persons with HIV. And it was interesting, 100% said presenting a case during an ECHO session influenced patient care significantly. But then a lot said that just observing a patient case, just listening, just participating in the discussion influence management of a patient in their practice. And again, that's one of the goals of ECHO is that it's hopefully serving not only the people presenting their case, but everyone else who's on, who's listening, who's a part of their discussion, and hopefully they're carrying that forward, sharing it with people in their practice and using it when a patient presents uh, um, with a relevant clinical issue. About a third said they had helped a local colleague manage an HIV seropositive pregnant based on knowledge learned during ECHO. And over a third said without ECHO, they'd refer to another provider. They'd refer a pregnant person with HIV to another provider. You can see the distance range there. I'm pretty sure the 589 miles by plane was, was a participant from Alaska. But again, hopefully Project ECHO was helping improve the quality of care locally, helping practitioners often who are in really busy primary care practices care for these chronic complex conditions locally and feel supported, feel like they have a community and specialists behind them supporting them. We similarly did some qualitative work around how well Project ECHO helps people feel knowledgeable and confident prescribing PrEP. Excuse me. So we did this um, in conjunction with colleagues from Washington State Department of Health. We integrated some regular learning about HIV prep into Project ECHO, including quarterly didactics and monthly case discussions. And then after about two years of that, we surveyed practitioners and asked them how well we were doing in terms of helping them improve their knowledge and confidence to prescribe HIV prep. You can see a very high proportion said that ECHO improved their knowledge regarding prep candidacy, laboratory monitoring adherence. We didn't do as well in those first two years helping people helping practitioners learn how to access PrEP in terms of insurance and financial resources. So that helped us. So then we integrated a series of talks on accessing PrEP, accessing whether it's PrEP DAP or, or patient support services or copay assistance or anything like that. So again, this was really important for our own QI as well. A very high proportion said we were helping them stay up to date on national PrEP guidelines, said that participating in Project ECHO increased their likelihood to prescribe PrEP said that as a result of knowledge gained from ECHO, they had served as a resource for other medical providers in their region. And 40% said without Project ECHO, they would refer their patients to another provider for PrEP, which I, I just found fascinating. We all know that PrEP can be done by primary care, but there's a lot of discomfort around it. Now we were doing this work back, this was 2015 to 2017, a lot's evolved with PrEP. I don't know if we'd get the same result now, but back then, when we were really working hard to educate practitioners about PrEP, I, I think this was a notable finding. Qualitative, limited, definitely, but I, I think there was something here that really helped us learn how we were serving providers and to improve the way in which we were serving providers. Now, how do we evaluate patient level outcomes with Project ECHO? On the right, I think this was fascinating. You can see here from Health Affairs, a blog titled Project ECHO Enthusiasm Overtakes Evidence. This was created a big stir in our Project ECHO world. And I don't think it was totally wrong. There are a lot of publications on Project ECHO. A lot of them are descriptive. A lot of them are qualitative. We really feel like we're helping practitioners feel more confident, take better care of people. We get positive feedback. But how do we prove that? How do we actually show that patient level outcomes are improving? There are a lot of challenges to this. Again, we are not seeing patients. We don't have access to the EHR for the, the cases we're hearing about. We don't 
uh, we often don't hear about the outcome. We don't have direct access to the patient level of data. And on HIV Project Echo, we are asked a variety of clinical questions. We might be asked about ART for someone who has a detectable viral load, or we might be asked about mental health. We might be asked about um, substance use. We might be asked about something totally non-related. So again, what are the, 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 what are the feasible ways to assess patient level outcomes and um, evaluate how we are having an impact on the patient level? There also has never been a clear mechanism for funding for, for Project ECHO evaluations. Now, there are some patient level outcomes in the hepatitis C world. I've seen um, a couple of uh, um, outcomes published from Diabetes Project Echoes, but I do think that overall the patient level outcomes research it is lacking and is an area in which we need um, focused work. In this context, we were able to do a viral load analysis for our HIV Project Echo, which um, really involved a lot of work. Susan and Richard can tell you uh, it involved several years. It was delayed a bit by the pandemic. Um, it was a really a nice collaboration between our AETC team, Seattle Public Health, uh, King County, Washington State DOH, Oregon Health Authority, um, uh, um, Jim Hughes from, from EPI. And um, again, took a lot of work, uh, but I think served as the first HIV Project ECHO viral load outcomes analysis of its kind and I'd like to show you a little bit and then get your thoughts and reflections and, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up and, and take questions and comments. So what we were trying to do, we were trying to compare viral load suppression uh, defined as less than 200 copies among patients whose providers participate in Project ECHO, which we called a direct effect compared to patients whose providers do not participate. That was our primary outcome, our primary aim. As secondary aims, we also tried to look at this indirect effect, we called it, of what if a practitioner is not involved in Project ECHO themselves, but they work in the same clinic or clinic system as someone who is. And then we also uh, had a couple of other outcomes looking at how viral load suppression rates changed by level participation in the program. Um, and I'll, 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 sh I'll show you more. So we were able to use all viral load results from two states in the region, Washington and Oregon. So only two states out of those practitioners who are involved in our program. However, the majority of our sites, about half of our sites uh, are in the, located in those two states. We did make efforts to uh, include other states and for various reasons, you know, viral load databases, databases being incomplete and others. Uh, we did not end up including data from other states, but from Washington and Oregon, we had really robust data um, from the uh, uh, National Surveillance Database um, with viral loads going back to 2011, so starting a year before the program launched all the way up to 2018. We ended up, as I'll show you, with 65,000 plus viral loads that we ended up assigning to a specific provider and to a specific clinic system. Uh, based on ordering provider. I mean, this took a lot of cleaning data to, to um, remove duplicate provider names, um, to, um, to assign every viral load as accurately as possible to provider and to clinic system. We attempted to assign by specific clinic, but the data just wasn't specific enough and detailed enough to assign by clinic. So in the end, every viral load was assigned to provider and clinic system based on county. So for example, community health centers of Snohomish County, there are three or four sites would all be considered together under the same clinic system. So then every viral load is assigned to provider and clinic system and then providers assigned to one of three groups, either participating in Project ECHO, not participating in Project ECHO, or not participating, but working in a clinic system with a provider who does participate. So our primary comparisons were, number one, viral loads of patients, of providers participating in Project ECHO compared to not participating at all, and then a separate analysis based on participating, not participating, or not participating, but working in the same clinic system as a provider who does. Again, trying to get at that idea that if one 
provider participates, they're going to share resources and share knowledge amongst their uh, um, their local colleagues. Now you can see here um, a bit more about the methods. We did, exclude, we did exclude Seattle and Portland metro areas. The focus of Project ECHO is outside of the metro areas. There's a lot of movement between clinics within the metro areas, and we excluded results from non-primary care settings. Really, Project ECHO focuses on primary care um, clinics and primary care clinical care for people with HIV. We did uh, also uh, divide providers into whether they uh, are relatively low volume moderate volume or high volume providers in terms of how many people with HIV they see and care for based on the number of viral loads they send per quarter. And then uh, providers could move between the echo cohort and the non-echo cohort. So we did this by quarter. And if a provider started to particip participate in echo defined as participating in at least three sessions, they could move from non-echo to echo. And if a provider dropped out of echo, they could move from echo to non-echo, though that was quite rare. Uh, there's a bit more detail here. If you want to get really into the stats, we we got to invite Jim back from retirement to get really into the stats because, I mean, Jim was so crucial to, to making that happen. But overall, I, I want to show you a bit more about what we found. Uh, overall, there were 45 providers who met criteria for Project ECHO, again, from Washington and Oregon. Uh, there were about 2,600 providers included in the non-Project ECHO cohort. You can see most providers in the ECHO cohort fit into the relatively low volume uh, uh, category because they send less than 20, they order less than 20 viral loads per quarter. And you can see the median number of sessions they participated in. Um, these were the, the overall demographics based on Project ECHO and non-Project ECHO. Overall, we had a total of 65,000 plus viral loads that were assigned and used. We did have a, a uh, a process for imputing missing data, and we did exclude some data. Uh, if I remember right, I, I think it was out of 70,000 viral loads, we excluded about 5,000 and got down to about 65,000. 65, um, overall, the, the descriptions that the general characteristics between providers and patients between Project ECHO and non-Project ECHO were pretty similar. The Project ECHO cohort was more likely to be urban and non-Project ECHO more likely to be in a metropolitan area based on population size. But this is, this is our key finding. So these are regression coefficients, which uh, in this model are, are interpreted as difference in viral load suppression. So overall, for a direct effect comparing uh, patients whose providers participate in Project ECHO to patients whose, whose providers do not participate, there was a 13.7% improvement based on Project ECHO participation. You can see here that it was statistically significant. And then you can see here the breakdown by volume of provider. And really this um, improvement in viral load suppression was driven by the relatively lower volume providers. In the separate model that looked at direct and indirect, so look at three groups, looked at participating in Project ECHO, not participating or not participating, but working in a clinic system with somebody who does participate. You can see here, again, in the low volume category, pretty similar finding in terms of improvement in viral suppression with participation, but also an indirect effect, also an improvement, albeit more modest, an improvement in viral load suppression for those who don't participate in Project ECHO, but work in a clinic system for, with someone who does. Now, a couple interesting things about this. So in the early days of Project ECHO, we did focus on low volume providers. We actually initially were funded 100% by HRSA before Washington DOH got more involved and, and really had to involve low volume providers. So I think this really makes sense that it's the lower volume providers who, who, are, um, who are getting the most benefit. Um, there was more improvement in viral load suppression amongst the low volume providers based on number of sessions attended, I think is also logical. And for those providers engaged in Project ECHO for whom we had viral loads before and after participation, you can see here, for those uh, practitioners in the relatively low volume category, um, the percent change was greater than for those in the medium or high volume category. So this was specifically, this was limited only to the practitioners who participate. 
So overall, what we saw was an improvement in viral suppression for patients whose providers participate in Project ECHO, especially for providers who care for relatively fewer people with HIV based on number of viral loads ordered. We saw evidence of an indirect effect as well. And I think that again, as a way to look at viral load suppression, we capitalized on having these huge databases. We had a lot of viral loads. We had you know, a lot of uh, uh, time to look at. We had very sophisticated statistical modeling by Jim Hughes. I mean, we were so lucky we had him involved. Certainly there are limitations. There were some missing data, some imputations for data. There are confounders we can't account for. But I think this is a, a, really, um, a, a really notable suggestion that while Project ECHO is improving provider knowledge and confidence, hopefully it is also improving patient level outcomes. Now, coming back to this case I, I told you about at the beginning, so this was someone who, I, I, who over time was presented to Project ECHO actually eight different times during the pregnancy. The provider would present, get input from around the multidisciplinary panel, go back with suggestions um, related to their ART, their HIV, their mental health, their substance use. Um, actually, actually presented eight times during the during the pregnancy. Baby was born free of HIV. Mother achieved the lowest viral load she'd ever had, and we got really positive feedback from the practitioner. So, again, it is not a perfect program. There are gaps. There's a lot more research needed. There's a lot more research on patient level outcomes needed. But I show this as an example of the potential power of creating a community like this. For time, I'll just say, I, I think the biggest challenges going forward are ongoing funding and sustainability, and then the research to patient level outcomes. I would love to see our viral load analysis replicated. I'd love to be able to do a similar study looking at other outcomes. We spend a lot of time thinking about or talking about immunizations and cancer screening and cardiovascular risk and all kinds of different outcomes, which are key for people with HIV, but viral loads, um, uh, you know, we don't have the same state databases for, for those sorts of outcomes. So um, acknowledging the huge team that works on our Project ECHO, the incredible, oh, I, I had to show this. This is our team pre, pre-COVID, because um, how often do you get to see folks like David Spock in a costume? Um, huge team uh, uh, working on Project ECHO and then the amazing team that worked on the viral load analysis project. But um, I'll stop there. We'd love to hear your thoughts, reflections, suggestions. If you want to look at Dr. Aurora's TED talk from a number of years ago on Project ECHO, I put the link there and I'll, I'll stop there.